Good evening, you guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to welcome you to uh, Grand Rapids Community College. <clears throat> this is our sixth year hosting the Michigan State College of Human uh, Medicine's Your Health Lecture Series. Uh, thanks for the, taking the time out of your busy schedules. I know it's like one of the last beautiful nights that we'll have. Um, and maybe that's where <laughs> three quarters of our registration guests are. Um, so my name is Todd Tiano. Uh, I teach in the biological sciences department here. So um, thank you again for coming. And uh, um, our, our sponsors uh, for this pre, uh, uh, free public uh, event are uh, Grand Rapids Community College and Michigan State University College of Human uh, Medicine. So if we can give them a round of applause, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, thank you. At GRCC, we offer accessible and affordable education to a wide variety of students, whether it's a transfer student uh, for a student or a student enrolled in one of our degree programs. At GRCC is a great place to start your education. Um, you're sitting in the science auditorium of our Calkins Science Center, which is home to our biological sciences department and our physical uh, sciences department. For more, uh, more information uh, uh, about our wonderful programs, please visit our website at GRCC. GRCC.edu. Um, if you are a GRCC student who needs proof of being here tonight for class participation, something of that nature, um, there's a sign-in sheet outside, and you can get a hold of me, and, and I'll I'll vouch for you. Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce Keith English, uh, professor and chair, Department of Pediatrics and Human Development, at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Keith. Uh, I will speak for our department and for the college to say we love being part of this program. We love the connection here to GRCC. We're in a similarly named place down the hill, GRRC, the Grand Rapids Research Center, where we have a number of pediatric investigators, and we also have pediatric investigators just up the hill and right down the street from you in the Secchia Center, including Dr. Thompson, who's going to talk tonight. So thank you for having us here. Uh, Barbara can tell on me after this, but I already volunteered that some of our other researchers in the GRC and in the Secchia Center would be happy to come over and give some other talks to students in particular outside of this sort of once a year Your Health Series lecture. We're happy to have the connections. And in fact, we love it when we get enthusiastic undergraduates who want to work on a research project with one of our investigators. It's been our experience over the years that uh, these are often some of the very best people you can have assist you in a research project that works both ways. It's a win-win when a talented undergraduate wants to assist one of our faculty members in a research project. So my background is in pediatrics and pediatric infectious diseases. Uh, I used to not joke, but say sort of honestly that when I came here six years ago, mostly what I knew about autism was it was not caused by vaccines. I knew that. I knew a lot about vaccines, and I knew that vaccines didn't cause autism. I've learned about a lot about autism in the past few years, though, because it's common, it's important, uh, and we've had some philanthropic support from generous families who've been affected by autism in their family to try to help build research teams to study this important condition so that we can learn more about it to help children with autism and their families. So one of the people that I recruited who studies autism and related disorders is Dr. Barbara Thompson. So Barbara, I don't have your CV with me, so I'm going to wing this. So just do that eh thing when I get it wrong. I'm pretty sure that Barbara Barbara got her undergraduate degree at a place called Florida State University. We've had too many conversations about basketball games and football games for that not to be true. Then she got her PhD in psychology at the University of Delaware. She did a postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt University working in the lab of one of the leading developmental neuroscientists in the world, Pat Levitt who I knew back in my Memphis days when he was at Vanderbilt and I was in Memphis. Dr. Levitt then moved to Southern California and Barbara, uh, her future husband, other researchers from Vanderbilt also went to Southern California. So Barbara was there as a faculty member at the University of Southern California uh, in her work on autism. She was in two or three different colleges and a bunch of different departments uh, uh, studying autism related conditions. Some of that work she'll tell you about today because she's continued to do that. So recruited Barbara here just a year ago, hard to believe. 
Her husband, Dan Campbell, also a neuroscientist, came two years ago. They commuted back and forth a good bit for a year, and now they're both settled here in Grand Rapids as part of our research team. So Barbara has uh, published a lot of really beautiful work in this field of autism work. Is maybe she'll tell you her story and that she trained really in animal biology and abnormal development in animal models, but now she works mainly with children, with autism, with ADHD, and other conditions. And as you can tell from her title, She's interested in trying to understand what goes right and what goes wrong with social motivation and building social communication and social connections in children with autism and other disorders. So I think you'll learn a lot from her presentation tonight. So, Barbara, thanks for being here. I'm going to turn this off. I do, and I'm green. I'm good and to I'll go. I apologize for leaving soon. <laughs> Bye, Keith. Great. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I know it's a, uh, an evening, and as was mentioned, it's one of the nice few last evenings before the snow hits. Um, coming from Southern California, it seems imminent at any point the snow is going to hit. I survived last year. I don't know whether or not I can do this two years in a row, so, <laughs> so let's, not, let's not do that. But anyway, back to the talk. Um, so the work I'm going to present tonight is a combination of uh, things that we did at USC and what we have continued to do here at MSU. So my lab does, in fact, have a website, um, and I'm going to talk about work that uh, my current postdoc has continued and my uh, research coordinator has has also continued as well. So um, the big talk for this evening is autism spectrum disorders. So it is a behaviorally defined disorder. Um, the DSM-5 uh, says states that there are social communication and social interaction deficits, uh, and it's partnered with restricted repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. Um, the numbers have changed and continue to change as diagnoses uh, become more accurate and we get into more rural areas and uh, start to assess uh, the underserved populations. It's currently at 1 in 68, but that number is probably closer to 1 in 60, 1 in 55. It does affect males more frequently than females. Um, and so what I want to talk to you tonight about are the social communication and social interaction deficits that make up the, the disorder. So some of these altered social interactions um, have been well characterized, and I only give you a smattering, um, but it, you know, it's everything from the child not paying attention to their name being called at the very first birthday party. Um, they have difficulties establishing relationships with others. There is a hotly contested um, concept that these children don't make eye contact, when really it's a better description that um, the eye contact is, is often inappropriate or or it doesn't feel right. Um, there are deficits in joint attention and so on and so forth. So the social interaction deficits have been well described in this population. Um, so I'm going to switch. I'm going to go to what my undergraduate, my graduate, my postdoc work uh, looked at, which was animal models. So I'm going to show you a series of pictures. That That's not part of me. I'm going to show. I'm going to show you a series of pictures. How many of you think that you could identify a sad rat? It looks like this. OK. What about a surprised rat? <laughs> they, th those are very different animals. What about an anxious rat, a happy rat, bored rat, and an eager rat? OK. Those animals look identical. They also cannot tell us that they are feeling surprised, anxious, bored, sad, happy, and so on and so forth. And so as a behavioral neuroscientist, we have to get really creative in our assessments of how we can determine how animals are feeling. Animal models serve the need of better understanding the biological underpinnings for uh, a number of things, including uh, disorders. So now I'm going to switch to a different rodent animal, all right? This is audience participation is, is needed right here. So why is Jerry running? He's going for cheese. Oh, for the first time, I got both answers in the same audience. So yes, all right. So either, either Jerry's running away from Tom or Jerry is running towards the cheese. And so if you take this back to basic psychology, we're talking about either avoidance motivation or approach motivation. And so avoidance, the animal is going to energize away from whatever that stimulus is versus for approach, the animal is going to utilize that energy to go towards the stimulus. 
So let, now let's go back to autism. So how can we utilize this information? How can we apply approach and avoidance motivation to better understand autism, specifically those social behavioral deficits that, uh, be, that define the disorder? So in the world of autism uh, research, there are two opposing theories that, that uh, attempt to describe what drives these deficits in social interactions. And the first is that social interaction is not rewarding. It's not reinforcing for these individuals. And so unless you are a huge fan of pencils, social interaction might make you feel the same way that looking at this pencil does, which is it doesn't really do anything for you. The result is that the child does not approach social interactions, right? So Jerry's not going to approach that cheese because that cheese really doesn't do anything for him. So the child is not going to approach social interactions interactions. In contrast, guess where I'm going with this, the second theory for why there are deficits in social interaction in individuals with autism is that social interactions are aversive. So this is a true picture of me getting stuck on a swinging bridge because it was terrifying. So social interactions may be aversive for individuals with autism. And so the result is the child avoids social interactions. So Jerry is running away from Tom, all right? But if you look at it, truly, it's the same sort of deal. So the child is going to have altered social interactions. The individual is going to have altered social interactions. But the underlying mechanism that is driving that behavior is different. However, whenever a child is diagnosed with autism, they are merely stated to have social communication deficits. And while that helps in providing a diagnosis, it really doesn't tell us much more beyond that. So why should we care? Well, uh, the neural circuitry that underlies those two mechanisms are quite different. So for fear and anxiety, we have limbic circuit activation. And for uh, lack of motivation, we would have deficits in, in reward circuitry. And of course, the genetic contributions then within those circuits also are, are likely quite different. Uh, it would allow us then to identify what is driving heterogeneity in the population, just simply in terms of social behavior, but also in treatment response. Um, and ultimately, it should help inform behavioral interventions that are being provided for these individuals. Um, because for a child who finds social interaction just not motivating, one could provide a very huge hit of social interaction and training for how to appropriately socially interact. And that might work for a child who just simply isn't paying attention to social interactions in their environment. However, one can imagine that that would be the exact wrong thing to do for an individual for whom social interaction is quite aversive. And so for that individual, perhaps uh, there should be a focus on decreasing fear and anxiety during those social interactions prior to hitting the kid over the head with so much social interaction. So ultimately, what we're talking about is then personalized medicine for autism treatment or for autism spectrum disorders. So how are we going to resolve this? How are we going to resolve whether or not for some kids, there is uh, the underlying neural mechanism might be fear and anxiety versus uh, lack of reward. And so it, we need to utilize a task that can discriminate between an aversive stimulus versus a stimulus that's just simply not motivating. And we need to be able to probe that intent without needing a verbal response from our kids because obviously there are communication uh, deficits in this disorder. And so we don't want to have to rely on asking a kid, hey, how does social interaction make you feel? If you ask a typically developing kid that question, you get a whole hodgepodge of responses as well. So we're looking for something that's quantifiable. And this is where the animal models come in to play. So we turn to condition place preference called CPP, which is a strategy developed in experimental models. It's based on associative learning. So all of you know Pavlov and Pavlov's dogs, right? And so you had a bell that was presented prior to the dogs receiving their food for dinner, lunch, breakfast, whatever it was. Every time before the dogs were fed, the bell was rung. And after a number of pairings, the bell itself um, would um, initiate digestive juices flowing in the dogs and salivation because the bell came to represent that the dogs were going to be fed soon. 
So it is based on an associative learning model. Um, and it was actually originally designed to test the reinforcing properties of drugs of abuse. And the way that the paradigm works is the animal is put into an environment that has two, at least two different uh, environments. And it can be visually different. It can be tactilely different. It can smell different. So on one side, the animal's going to get uh, the drug of, of abuse, in this situation, cocaine. And on the other side, the animal's going to get saline. And after a number of pairings, the animal starts to learn that on the green side, the green checkered side over here, they're going to get cocaine. And on the orange striped side, they're only going to get saline. And then whenever you test the animal, you can test the animal in a drug-free state. And so cocaine is no longer present in the animal. And you simply measure the amount of time that the animal spends on each side. If the animal chooses to spend the majority of their time in that green checkered room, you can interpret that as the stimulus that the animal received, cocaine in this situation, that stimulus was rewarding, reinforcing. They enjoy being in that room. If, however, cocaine was too high of a dose, it made the animal sick, it made them feel lethargic, whatever, they will avoid that room. And so they will spend the majority of their time in the room where they received the vehicle saline. And then if the drug was just not at the right dose. So it was neither reinforcing and rewarding, but neither was it aversive, then there should be no difference between the two rooms in terms of where the animal chooses to spend their time. And so there's equal amounts of time for each room. So we decided that we should, uh, oh, and, and, and another key point, this has been done in a variety of animals, uh, a variety of species, um, and it's been done with a number of conditioning stimuli. So food, access to sex, access to aggression, play, wheel running, mother-infant bonding, social interaction, and I have a video here, but it's really not important other than I have to hit escape to get out of it. So this is a rabbit who has been conditioned with cocaine. Um, guess which room? This one. And, there, and what you can't see is there's a little door right here that the animal actually can go through, but it decides I have no interest in going to that other side. Um, and so there are also, as I mentioned, social interactions. So in this diagram, um, the colors don't come out, but the floors are different colors here. And so animals are put together in a, in a cage with a number of other animals. And they, rodents happen to be very social animals. And they get conditioned by themselves using a different color flooring. And then whenever it's time to test the animal in that drug-free state, the animal actually chooses the side that is colored um, similar to how the social conditioning uh, is colored. So there's a ver wide variety of stimuli that can be used. There's a wide variety of species that can be used. And we said, why not do this in the human population? We know that kids can do uh, associative learning very easily. Uh, there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do this. We are not talking about doing cocaine in kids. Um, but we were not the first ones to have this thought of let's do condition place preference in, in humans. But we needed to design an arena um, that wasn't a small plexiglass box that we use for animal models. So being in LA at the time, we had access from a person who knew a person who knew a person to the set designer for six feet under. So this castle was built by the set designer for six feet under. Um, it was located at USC. And then we broke it down and brought it here to MSU, and it is across the street in the Secchia Center. Um, and I will show you more pictures. So there's two rooms. There's an orange room, there's a green room, um, and there's a door in between the two rooms. This is the door in between the two rooms. There are similar toys in, the two, in each room, and you can see up here we have video cameras where we can record what the child is doing at all times. And so this is from the outside. This is looking straight on. And this is from one of the cameras angled down. And then these are the dimensions of the, uh, of the castle. So it's a pretty large arena um, that allows the child to go in and play. And we videotape the entire thing. So as I said, we were not the first ones to have this idea of, hey, can you do condition place preference in humans? So sure enough, um, amphetamine is quite rewarding for humans. 
we, we knew that. Um, but you can establish a very strong condition place preference in humans. These are all, this is adults. And then turns out there were quite a few more. So music, um, this virtual reality one was college age students where they asked the students not to eat the night before. They came in and played a virtual reality game where every time they went and explored the green room, they gave the, the college student a chocolate M&M. Then they went over to this room and they didn't get an M&M. So they kept coming back to this room and they got a chocolate M&M. And it turns out they really liked the room where they got the chocolate M&M because they were quite hungry. Um, secondary reinforcers, drinkers, all right. And then we, we did publish um, that you can, in fact, establish condition place preference in young kids. So this was children aid. This was typically developing kids two and a half to five years of age. And we just had a really cool toys on one side and books and puzzles on the other side. And we established that there was a very strong conditioning in typically developing kids um, that was independent of cognitive level. So while we were recruiting typically developing kids, we also looked at whether or not that strength of conditioning correlated with uh, cognitive performance, and it did not, which gave us great hope that we can move this into a cognitively um, challenged population such as autism, and it didn't matter whether or not our kids were verbal or nonverbal, high functioning, we could recruit anybody because we had, we had no relationship between cognitive level and conditioning. So, but that wasn't social condition place preference, and nobody has done social condition place preference in humans. So, can we do social condition place preference in young children? So this is what it would look like, all right? So instead of cocaine and the rabbit, I'm gonna show you in the green room, the kid's gonna get social interaction, and in the orange room, the child is gonna play by themselves. And in the testing of the drug-free situation, so there's no social interactor in here, if the child goes back to the room where that social interaction occurred, you can interpret that as social interaction is rewarding, it's reinforcing to the child. If there's no difference between the two rooms, then you can interpret that as social interaction is just simply not reinforcing. It might not be salient in the child child's environment. And then if they avoid that room where that social interaction occurred by spending the majority of their time on the opposite side, then you can interpret that as social interaction as aversive for these individuals. So in a cartoon diagram, what this looks like, so we're bringing in both typically developing kids and kids with a diagnosis of autism. For those kids that come in with a diagnosis of autism, we do a confirmatory ADOS. Um, and every kid gets a cognitive test called the Mullen Scales of Early Learning. That takes about 45 minutes. Then they walk through the castle so that they, it's a habituation. It's what you would do in an animal model to get them used to the environment. Um, so you walk the kid through the castle. And then they get the initial preference test. It's a six minute test and they have access to both the yellow room and the green room. You can see the door is open here. So the child is just playing in the castle by themselves. They have access to both rooms. Both, room have t both rooms have toys. And then we change the toys out and we put a social experimenter on one side and no social experimenter on this side, but identical toys and we alternate A, B, A, B, A, B. Trial A is where they have access to the social experimenter here in the green room, and trial B is where they're playing by themselves. That door down the middle of the castle is closed. They don't have access to the social experimenter. So we do this, we do this pairing, this associative learning over a number of trials. Each trial is three minutes, so they get a total of four exposures to each room. After that, we change the toys back out to the baseline toys, that middle door is opened back up again, and the child has access to both rooms, both the green room and the orange room, but the social experimenter has been removed. So all we're doing is during the initial preference test, we're measuring where's the child choosing to spend their time, and in the final preference test, where does a child choose to spend their time? Which room, and is there a difference following conditioning? Uh, yeah, I've already talked about that. So the hypothesis then is that our children with ASD, so if we have uh, a social preference, hmm, fun, continuum along the x-axis here that, that ranges everything from aversion all the way to reward. We would expect that our typically developing kids, we expect heterogeneity, even in the typically developing kids, we would expect that, that range of responses to look as if 
the majority of typically developing kids would find this social interaction rewarding. And we would expect that there would be a leftward shift for our kids with ASD, but you'll notice there's still heterogeneity in that population. We don't think it's a one size fits all. We think there's a combination of kids who find it either aversive or just don't find it motivating. But we would expect that we could see a difference between the two populations, possibly. All right, so that's the hypothesized model uh, for the distribution. So when we were at USC, we enrolled 73 participants in the study. 52 of those were typically developing kids. 21 of those were eight children with a diagnosis of autism. Our typically developing uh, kids are ages two and a half to five, and our ASD kids are uh, three to five and a half. To, uh, we were trying to cognitively match the two groups. So the chronological age, the actual age of the kids is different. Uh, there were a total of 51 kids, you'll notice that's not 73. There are a total of 51 kids that completed the social condition place preference. That is because 22 of them we had to exclude for a number of reasons. Either the child did not want to separate from the parent and asked the parent to come into the castle, which then interfered with conditioning. The child refused to go into the castle after a certain number of times, or we actually had developmental delay concerns in our typically developing kids as well. So those were excluded. So there were a total of 15 typically developing kids that were excluded and seven kids with autism that were excluded from the final analysis. Uh, looking at the basic demographics of these individuals, you'll see here, this is the chronological age. We have a much younger group in the typically developing uh, kids than we did in our kids with ASD. And you will see that we also have very significantly impacted children with autism, um, though we have quite the range of performance that sometimes meets the max uh, of our typically developing kids as well. So this, this study was important from the beginning. We wanted to make certain that there was no kid with autism that could not be enrolled in this study um, to make certain that we were getting a better understanding of all autism and not just high-functioning kids. So um, the data for our typically developing kids uh, at USC demonstrated that there was a very strong uh, condition, a very strong social condition place preference using a social stimulus as the conditioning stimulus. Um, it, but then if you plot our individual uh, uh, individuals on a graph, you can see there's quite a bit of variability. This is our typically developing population. So you can see some kids did in fact show that nice increase uh, following conditioning, but you also see some kids that are flat and you see some kids that actually avoided that room where that conditioning occurred. So the question really was, all right, but what about our autism group? So our social condition place preference works for our kids with autism as well. You'll see there's more variability in our post scores here than there was for our TD. And whenever you plot these individual kids, you can see there's, there is a kid who went from zero all the way up to about 99% of their time spent on that social side. Uh, but you also see flatline, and you see some kids that are coming down as well. When you plot those next to each other, the only thing that really stands out is the variability in our autism group. Uh, but there are no differences between the two groups. And so we had a moment of, oh my God, there's no difference between groups. What do I do? Well, maybe we don't have a very strongly impacted autism group, okay? Maybe we, we got a, maybe we, maybe we didn't really get kids that were that strongly uh, affected by autism. So about halfway through, um, we started using the SRS. So the SRS is a parent report asking the parent about their child's behavior over the past six months related to social um, behaviors. So it includes five subscales of social awareness, cognition, communication, so on and so forth. But it's a parent report. All right, and we had both our parents of individuals with autism as well as parents of typically developing kids fill out these questionnaires and, and show, no, we have a very strongly impacted population of kids with autism, um, and, and we had some parents who rated their typically developing kids as very significantly impaired uh, socially, so there's no overlap. So it's not that we didn't have an autism group. Uh, that can't possibly explain why we don't see a difference between the two groups. 
So going back to this hypothesis of, you know, we're going to see our typically developing kids distributed like this and a leftward shift for our kids with ASD, we said, well, what does the data actually look like if we were to plot it as we said we would? Um, so hypothetical down here as a reminder. So here is our USC data. So it wasn't our kids with autism that were a problem. Our kids with autism did exactly what we thought that they might do, which was show this leftward shift. The problem was our typically developing kids did not show such a huge reinforcing uh, um, um, output as we had expected. There's quite a bit of heterogeneity in the typically developing population and far less in the, in the ASD group in terms of where they're peaking. So that's the USC data. We have since, so that's the USC data up here as well. Uh, we started collecting data in March of this year, um, and we have run 23 kids through the uh, social condition of place preference. And you can see that our MSU data is also similar, that we have this very strong peak in our ASD population, the majority of which are showing a, a Either no change, that's what this dark dotted line is down the middle, or maybe a, a negative shift uh, away from uh, no difference. But it's our typically developing population again, which isn't showing such a huge preference. So we have a number of ways that we are thinking about why that typically developing group isn't showing it. We think possibly the six minute test at the end, uh, we have a number of kids, and I, I don't have a video. Um, I can show any of you a video afterwards. But we have kids who will walk into the castle during that final preference test, and we don't tell them what's happening. We don't say, hey, the experimenter is going to leave now, or hey, you're going to meet somebody new. We just have them leave when the child's not looking. And we have a number of kids who walk into that final preference test, and they walk into the castle, hey, where'd she go? And they turn around and they look. And then they walk in, and so they continue on the task. And what we think is happening, actually, we think we probably have a little bit of a washout, that for the first minute or two minutes, our kids are probably going to that social paired side, sitting there and playing. But after a while, they realize, this person's not coming back. Why am I staying in this room when I can go over to this other room and play as well? So now we're going back and we're analyzing minute by minute instead of taking the full six minutes to see whether or not we do, in fact, have a washout period. So, um, but, but what part of the task was, was to move beyond a simple diagnosis, right? We can diagnose autism just fine. We can diagnose that a kid does not have autism just fine. So our Mullen aligned right up there with the diagnosis. The ADOS, which was our confirmatory, does the kid have autism? Yes, aligns with the diagnosis. The SRS separated out the groups as well. And a, a behavior rating scale that we used on some of the in interactions between the child and the social experimenter also differentiated these groups. But what we have is actually what we had hoped to have, which is that Social CPP does not distinguish between the groups, but instead gives you this continuous score for every kid um, related to their social behavior. So it's not that we don't have exactly what we wanted. We just had the wrong hypothesis going in that it was going to separate out the groups, where it doesn't necessarily have to separate out the groups. What instead we have shown is that Individuals with autism, some of them find that social interaction quite rewarding, quite reinforcing. They walk in and, hey, where'd she go? But we also have the kids who want nothing to do with that social interaction when it's ongoing, and they avoid the room whenever they're given the choice. So the castle is nice. The castle is wonderful. We brought the castle from Southern California. But is there an easier way to get at this heterogeneity of social motivation? So is there a more biophysical readout? And for this, we said, let's do some eye tracking. Let's see whether or not eye tracking can reveal similar patterns of heterogeneity in social motivation by using a proxy of attention to social uh, scenes. So do the two groups of children attend to social and non-social scenes similarly? So this is a hypothesis that is being tested by others, whether or not there's gaze indifference, a lack of motivation, or is it gaze aversion? Um, and so we are using um, a very high resolution eye tracker um, that captures, um, that uses infrared 
uh, tracking to get, to capture both the eye gaze and position in 3D space. So this is what it looks like. It's a non-remote system. The kid is just simply sitting in front of a monitor, and there's an infrared bar along the bottom of the monitor that is tracking what the kid is looking at. So he's just sitting there, just sitting there, just sitting here, wherever. And you can see the stimulus uh, computer that's running everything and collecting the data, and then this is the monitor that the child is watching. And it's, it's a very easy system, um, as long as there's not too much movement back and forth, the, it, it's a very strong system to pick up on eyes. So what we're actually looking at, um, what, what we can measure um, in capturing gaze, we can look at fixations. Uh, so where the eye stops moving and simply sits for a certain amount of time, and that's thought to reflect attentional engagement. And then you can look at saccades, so that's the flickering from scene to scene. Um, and, and whether, and there's some thought that saccades reflect attentional switching um, and searching for and integrating the visual information that's being presented in front of you. And then there's saliency, which we won't even get into tonight. So as in children with ASD, that should read. So <laughs> a slight, I'm going from an Apple, from a Mac to a PC, and I think the PCs always hated the Mac, so I think it's just having fun with me tonight. Um, so in general, we had much more movement in our kids with ASD uh, than we did with our typically developing kids. And so we had much more data lost in our kids with ASD, but we still captured quite a bit of data. So what is the stimulus that's being presented? The stimulus is a six minute video. All right, and the video is comprised of both social and non-social cartoons and videos. So it was a good friend of mine at USC uh, in the computer science department who sat there and went through, I don't know how many hours of YouTube videos um, and decided this six second clip and this six second clip and this six second clip and parsed it all together into a six minute video. There's no language, um, there, are, there are sounds, there's music behind uh, whatever is going on, but there is no language that is utilized. And so it's a combination of social stimuli. So these are just little snippets of those videos that you'll see. There's a variety of social stimuli, but there's also a lot of non-social, highly salient uh, images and cartoons that are also being played. And so the kid is just sitting there watching. You know, we get them all excited. Hey, you want to watch TV? Yeah. Yeah, and of course all the kids, yes, please. All right, come sit. Mm, this is a crazy video, right? It's every six seconds it changes. Well, where's Dora? We, we didn't say Dora. <laughs> There's no Dora. So this is a, you know, here's an example, and it quickly shifts into the social. And then here's, <laughs> I, have to, I have to give this explanation. This is actually a clip from The Bachelor, and my friend thought it would be fun to throw it in the middle. And so whenever you have parents sitting in the room, it's usually the parents, is that? Is that? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, sure is, but the kids are like, what's going on? Because watch, it's a very, it's a very heavy scene, no language whatsoever. <laughs> it's like dramatic music behind it and everything. You're just like, oh, all right. So what you can do then, six seconds, all right, you can then look, you can put the gaze patterns on top of those, on top of that stimuli, you can do it by group. So this is the typically developing kids in blue and the kids with ASD in green, and then you can merge the two and see, are they looking at the, symbol, are they looking at the same thing within each clip? And for this clip, yes, absolutely, you would say they're looking at the same thing, which is right in the middle where the helicopter is twirling around. So if we look at this very, um, heavy social scene, you'll see that there's a lot of spread in our typically developing kids. And what that can reflect is that's either a lot of, there's, there's not a whole lot of focus, and so our kids are looking at a lot of things. Um, and, and so what is actually happening here is our typically developing kids are going back and forth between the faces because that's a very heavy scene. And our typically developing two and a half to five year old kids are picking up on the fact that something strange here. Why aren't they talking to each other? So they're looking back and forth. Whereas our kids with ASD, you'll notice, they're looking at those eyes, but they get stuck. So they don't alternate back and forth. They're not looking to figure out what's going on in this scene. They're not grabbing more information. They get stuck on a single face. So 
but let's let's actually quantify this, okay? So what we did is we looked at actual, we broke the scenes into what we classified as either social scenes or non-social scenes, and then we counted fixations. And what we see is that our typically developing group shows more fixations overall, we knew that already, but they also show more fixations to in those social scenes. Our ASD group, however, shows the exact same pattern. So while they have fewer fixations, they're showing more fixations during the social scenes. Interestingly, those fixation durations are longer in the non-social scenes. So they are, for the, for the social scene, it seems to be that they're looking back and forth probably between the two faces or the two individuals that are interacting much more frequently during the social scenes than they are in the non-social scenes. And you can see that this pattern is true for our kids with ASD as well. We then thought, well, is it, are, are these effects strictly limited to diagnosis? What if we looked at our uh, cognitive age of a, a lower cognitive score, one standard deviation away from norm? And so this includes typically developing kids as well uh, as individuals with ASD. And what we see is that fixations increase as the cognitive scores increase as well, independent of diagnosis. And it's true that fixations are greater for social scenes than they are for non-social scenes, independent of what that cognitive ability is. We then said, all right, well, what about the SRS? Does it correlate with social performance as assessed by the parents? And so as, um, SRS scores increase, that means that there's more social impairment rated by the, rated by the parent. And so as uh, the SRS score increases, fixations decrease. But again, even, even so, uh, there is more attention, more fixation being paid during the social scenes. So then we said, okay, well, we've separated out social scenes from non-social scenes, but what about what's going on within those social scenes? What if we created areas of interest in those social scenes and said, let's pay attention. What are kids looking at during these social interactions, in this case, between these two babies, and then in this case, you know, between bachelorette number one and bachelorette number two, and then the two ballerinas, all right? So we, we put an area of interest around these faces to look at what is, what is actually being paid attention to during these vignettes of social interaction. And sure enough, our children with ASD actually show more fixations outside the region, outside the areas of interest. And so while they are looking more during these social scenes, they have more fixations during the social scenes, those fixations are not occurring necessarily on the faces of, of these interactions. So then the question becomes, can we predict? So, so we started with a castle, and we have this beautiful heterogeneity of response. And our question was, well, should we move it into something that's easier to transport, right? I'm not going to, we can't get every kid into the castle, and I can't take the castle to every single kid. So maybe we could do eye tracking and get that heterogeneity. We get some of that heterogeneity. But really, does that heterogeneity in eye tracking match or predict that behavior in the castle. And so the po my, my postdoc is working on machine learning and trying to determine whether or not some of the basic metrics that we capture during eye tracking, so number of fixation, duration, percent looking, so on and so forth, whether or not those metrics can predict, accurately predict, what performance in the castle, which is indicative of social motivation, whether or not that can predict um, social condition place preference. And so our preliminary data suggest yes, just with the sample size that we have, which is a small sample size for machine learning, uh, that using those basic metrics that I showed you, fixation, duration, AOIs, um, that can accurately predict whether or not a, a child is going to have a very strong, anything greater than 25% 
uh, change in social condition place preference compared to a child who is under that 25%, so two classes. So the disadvantage with this small sample size with machine learning is we don't get the full range, right? The beauty of condition place preference is I can get a score from negative 100 to positive 100 for a kid. The problem with machine learning to get that full range, to predict that full range, you have to have 1,000 kids. But what I can do is I can say, am I going to have a kid that shows a very strong preference for social condition, play, for, for social interaction, or am I going to have a kid that doesn't have a very strong uh, conditioning and doesn't find social interaction rewarding? So we can do that with a smaller sample size pretty well. So in summary, um, our social CPP scores are not significantly different between the two groups of kids, between our typically developing kids and our kids with ASD. There is considerable heterogeneity. Both populations, both our typically developing kids and our kids with ASD. Um, and so we think this is actually an opportunity to then delve deeper into these endophenotypes of social motivation that are not you know, yes, this kid has autism. No, this kid doesn't have autism. It's, it, that doesn't really help the kid in the end. Can we better describe that social uh, interaction? So what I didn't mention, but I, m you may have picked up on me stressing the difference in the chrono chronological age between the two groups. So our typically developing kids are younger, two and a half to five, versus our kids with autism, three to five and a half, because we were trying to match on mental age. We were trying to match on the cognitive ability. However, statistically, what comes out is that the chronological age of the child actually is associated with the strength of conditioning, such that the younger the kid is, the weaker the conditioning was, which makes sense if you think about a child walking away from mom, dad for the first time into this very novel castle, and mm, there's not a person afterwards in the, during the final preference test, they're not going to stick in there, right? They're going to go back to wherever that, that toy was that they wanted to play with. So, that is important because it could, in fact, be underlying why we don't have such a strong performance in our typically developing kids is that we are heavily skewed to the younger age. And so the difference in chronological age between the two groups may be driving um, that lack of difference. So um, eye tracking results indicate that there are differences between the groups, um, but there is a social preference in our kids with ASD. Um, and within the specific area of interest, uh, we know that our kids with ASD are not fixating on those faces as much um, as our typically developing kids are. So for future directions, um, we're going to look at that developmental time course of social condition place preference. So not only are we taking our typically developing kids at two and a half years of age, we also want to extend out and so go beyond five years of age, expecting that with the full range and more kids in each sample size, we'll be able to show that there is, in fact, a time course for condition place preference that gets stronger as the, as the child ages. Um, the current protocol maximizes reward. And so that initial preference test before the conditioning begins, we are determining whether or not the kid has an innate preference for the green room or the orange room. So we are recording and measuring the percent time they're spending in the green room versus the orange room. Because what we're going to do, we're going to take the room that the kid doesn't care about, doesn't spend time in, and that's the room we're going to put the social experimenter in for the training. And what that does is that gives us a maximum amount amount of change. However, this is not necessarily a strength in the training uh, protocol because we have to condition against a preference. And so what is often used in animal worlds and animal models is just a random assignment. What that requires, though, is a much larger sample size than what we do working with humans. Uh, the other is to condition with the IPT preference. So instead of putting the social experimenter in the room that the kid didn't really spend that much time in, we would put the social experimenter in the room where the kid really had a preference but then we would minimize that change. And so we might not get that range of response in our ASD population and our TD to really make those comparisons. 
So it, it is what it is. We're, we are going to continue doing what we're doing with the caveat of we are maximizing our possible uh, um, effect. So we continue to analyze our eye tracking data. There is a lot of data that's collected. Uh, we have 600, piece, 600 points of data for every second, and that's six minutes of data collection. So there's a lot of data here. Um, and then we're continuing on with the um, machine learning aspect um, to determine whether or not eye tracking and the behavioral performance of the child, are they measuring the same construct, the same psychological construct of social motivation? Or if you combine them, does it give you a better understanding of that child and of that social motivation for that individual? And maybe it's a better way of characterizing social interaction rather than one or the other, and much better than, yes, this child has autism, or no, this child does not. So I have to, a, a number of people to thank, uh, most importantly, the families and children who come and participate in the lab. Um, this, this project has been, was conceived in, at Vanderbilt when I was a postdoc. It, we moved it to USC. We've moved it to MSU. So there, there are a number of people who have participated and continue to participate. Um, we are actively recruiting for the study. We continue to collect data. Um, and if you are interested either in participating in our research as a research uh, participant or helping us collect data, we are in fact looking for people to help. So I am done with my part and I am happy to answer questions if you have questions. Yeah. All right, any questions? I have, a f I have a few, but yeah, let's go. There you go. Um, what do you think the biggest takeaway, if you were to sum up your whole study in like one sentence, how would you like sum that up as like the most important parts, I guess? Yeah, uh, I, uh, the original goal of the project was to show that simply saying a child has autism doesn't help for designing intervention strategies a better characterization of those social interaction deficits or abnormalities is needed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take the next one. Okay. Um, in the, with, with the, the eye fixation, um, what are your thoughts on the, uh, autism spectrum disorder uh, group. Have you guys focused on what they're fixating on? Yeah, no, so that is the next step. The first question was, are they even looking at the same thing? Uh, they are not. So the next question is, so then what are they looking at? They show the same number of fixations in that scene type, right? So while that video is being played, it's not that they're over here. We have similar, similar counts, and we know that they attend to those social scenes more. But they're very clearly not, sometimes, but it's not a majority, it's not 50%. Are they looking at those faces, which is presumably where the majority of interaction is. However, in all of those social scenes, it's not just face-to-face -face interaction. You know, the, the two little girls are doing something in the middle. Um, so we, I, I would presume that what we've got in our ASD kids is probably paying attention to what the hands are actually doing. In the two little girls, the ballerinas that dump toys on their head, there's something in the background that grabs a lot of kids' attention. So the saliency idea of you know every single pixel that's being shown has some has a lot of information and what we should do and what we're going to do is take it on a pixel by pixel level because the amount of contrast between pixel 1 1 and 1 2 may be the most important thing in that entire scene but for the typically developing kids they get pulled to the faces whereas a kid with autism is going towards the most salient thing of the, of the of the video, okay. so we don't know yet. Yeah, I was interested. You know, I was I was wondering maybe they're focusing on other aspects of body language and yeah. and looking for more than what yeah. just a face can tell. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, I have I have always uh, I've I've always been 
against saying that kids with autism don't pay attention to faces. Um, there is plenty of data out there uh, to suggest that they do, and this whole eye contact story uh, is, is so mixed. Um, but really, when we saw that our kids with ASD show greater fixations during social scenes, we said, then we need to take apart these social scenes and figure out exactly what is going on. Uh, and the easiest thing and the quickest thing to do was create a circle around the face and say, OK. But you know, even the face itself ha is comprised of structures, the eyes and eyes, eyes and nose. Um, you know, and so we can go into those details as well. Um, but we haven't. We just simply put a circle around that face uh, as it moved across the video um, just as a first pass. I, didn't, I, we, I don't think we really expected to get any differences based on the fact that there were no differences in, in social scenes. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else? I don't want to steal the show here. <laughs> Anybody else have um, I One other thing I was wondering, and, and I, I, I I apologize for this question because I can't even imagine just controlling any of this has to be a nightmare, you know. So I was just wondering your, your can insight. Can I predict? Can I predict what your question is? Yeah, can I go predict? For it. Because I get this question, and if it's not, then I'm just going to open up this can of worms. Uh, I get asked a lot whether or not if we put a kid, a typically developing kid or a peer, into the castle as the social experimenter, what would we expect? Was that your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. was, yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, no. Uh, that uh, <laughs> it is a fabulous idea, and it took us a long time actually to come up with what that social experimenter, who that social experimenter was, what that social experimenter should do. Our original idea was that we would just have somebody reading a book in the corner whenever the kid walked into the castle, and every clinical psychologist said, "You cannot do that. That will make every kid run screaming." <laughs> <laughs> Why? They're not going to interact. No, they need to interact. They, you can't be stranger in the room just sure. sitting there, right? So, but of course, we would love to get a peer in there. However, the, um, uh, so our social experimenter has a pseudo script to go through. Uh, you know, it should be child led, this interaction, but especially the first trial when it's a, it's a new interaction. Our social experimenter is encouraged to encourage the child to play with whatever. Um, I didn't show the video tonight, but we have a minion and a birthday cake set, and we always start with the minion and the birthday cake set, and it's minion's birthday, and we're going to have a birthday party. Um, and so the kid, the second time that they come back in, the offer is made, would you like to do that, or would you like to try one of our other stations of play? That We have four quadrants in the room. And it's really it's up to the kid as to what they want to play with. To switch that into a peer that's driving that and to guarantee that there is a similar feel of interaction between two kids is much harder. I think the work that is done, you know, looking at play on playgrounds in a more naturalistic setting really gives us a better idea than in this very circumscribed setting of having a having a, a five-year-old child recite some play behavior activities. Um, we haven't done it. We, we think about it all the time, but the actual logistics of doing it kind of are overwhelming to us. That being said, um, you know, we've thought about moving the entire castle into a virtual reality scene. And then you know, it, there are difficulties with that, problems with that. But we could then play with the age of uh, the, the interactor. We could play some of the things we're going to do also in the, in the real castle is change the saliency of that social experimenter, right? And so we can. We can tune down the amount of interaction. We can also tune up the amount of interaction by telling our researchers, our, you know, our, our research assistants, you know, really, really be proactive about, you know, every minute there has to be some sort of interaction, or, you know, dial it down and only once every three minutes. So you would only have two interactions during that that, you know, entire time. So there are ways that we can play with that saliency, but we cannot play with the age of of our research assistants. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. There you go.
we've, we've got you know, a few minutes. So. Uh, I guess a question and comment, um, kind of on timeline with the where did you get the three minutes from? Yeah. Kind of where that comes from, and why not five or six? Yeah. And then uh, just a comment of, I guess picture myself as a kid and I play with someone for three minutes and then they leave me. Then I play alone. And then three minutes, they leave me. At the end of the day, I, well, I just want to play alone. They just keep leaving. You know, where like accuracy of, this person just keeps leaving, so I'd rather just do my own thing, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the timing, so we actually piloted this uh, in typically developing kids before we ever ran with it, um, because what we had to go off of was either adult models using virtual reality or animal models, which goes over several days. So we wanted an experiment that was for a single visit for a family, um, and we, we didn't want, it's, an, it's a young age for these kids, we didn't want them to be too exhausted. The entirety of the castle protocol itself is 48 minutes uh, if it runs smoothly. So you put that on top of a 45 minute cognitive test only if it's a typically developing test kid, another 45 minutes if it's a kid with autism, and you're talking about a three hour visit at this point. So we wanted to keep those trials short, but we knew from the animal leisure, well, we, we wanted to keep conditioning within a, a circumscribed time. We knew from the animal literature what's really more important than the length of time of those trials is the number of trials. So to make certain that, you know, they're, there are a minimum of some amount of exposures. Uh, our original plan was five minutes for each trial, but when you do that with a kid, it's just, the, I mean, they lose interest so quickly. Even the six minute, the six minute IPT and the six minute FPT began as a 10 minute IPT and a 10 minute FPT, and it, it, we, don't need it, we don't need it that long. And in fact, I think we will probably shorten now that we're going to go back and do the minute-by-minute -minute analysis of the FPT, uh, we will probably shorten that FPT. We might not shorten the IPT because often what happens with these kids is they'll go in, they'll notice a toy that they want to play with, they'll sit down, they'll get so absorbed by it, they don't go over to the other side until the last minute. But whenever they go over there, they get absorbed by whatever it is that they're playing with. And we want them to have exposure to both rooms, right? We, we need them to go and explore both rooms. So it was really a trial and error. Um, and based on we had nothing to go on other than we knew from the animal literature it needed to be repeated pairings. Animal literature goes over certain days. You have sleep to consolidate that learning, so on and so forth. We knew we would lose families if it was a number of days. Um, and so we, it, the very first study, the pilot, was to determine whether or not the length of time we thought would work. Um, but then the very first study was to show that this conditioning timeline actually produces a strong condition place preference in this age range. Um, you know, adults can probably get away with both longer conditioning trials as well as repeated days, especially if you're a college student getting, you know, course credit to go back and participate in this study. These are kids, these are families, and, and we didn't want that. Regarding that second point, um, we had concerns um, when we designed the study that especially for our kids with ASD that there would be a lot of resistance moving from side to side. Um, and we have an additional cue, uh, we have a timer that whenever the end of the three minutes goes, uh, whenever the three minute period is off, the timer beep, 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 beep. And then we open up the door of the castle and you know, we say it, but it's not necessary. We say it's time to go to the other side. And even our typically developing kids, right? They don't want to get up. It can sometimes take them a minute to two minutes to disengage from whatever activity it is. Um, but after a while, they know that, oh, they'll come right back and play, right? This is a chance to, you can do whatever you want. They also know that if they knock on the door, we're, we're right there. Um, so 
For the most, but that being said, we do have kids who, after a certain number of trials, like I don't, I don't want to do this anymore, and and they, you know, can either say it to us or they can exhibit behaviors that we are very well aware of. This kid has had enough, and and it's time to it's time to to end, and that's perfectly fine too. Some of that data we can use, some of that data we can't use, and and you know, it is what it is. So it it, you know, human research is a very different animal than animal research. Um, and, but there are advantages to, to, to both. And I, I, think, I think we get, a, I, think, I think this work is, is crucially important, actually, for the field. I think it's also crucially important for understanding social behavior in just typical development as well, just the developmental expression of social and emotional behaviors. Um, so it's not just about you know, better understanding autism. It's, better understanding social and emotional behaviors in, in this age range of, of kids. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, it is uh, slightly after 8, so thank you so much. If we can You're give welcome. Dr. Thompson a, yeah. a round of applause. Thank you.